And with that, um, I will turn this over um, to my colleague, um, Albert Palacios from the Benson to introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you, Alyssa. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Well, first of all, thank you all for joining us today. Um, I want to thank Alyssa Guzman for coordinating this event and for inviting the Lila Spenson Digital Scholarship Office to be a part of it. Uh, today's keynote is also part of the annual Lila Spenson Digital Scholarship in the America Speaker Series, which showcases the work of scholars who harness the potential of digital tools and methods to gain insights on topics within the fields of Latin American, uh, US Latina Latino, African diaspora, and indigenous studies. For our 2020 fall installment of the series, we have this, the distinct pleasure of highlighting the work of Nicole Paintar, who is a PhD candidate in the Department of Anthropology here at the University of Texas at Austin. Her research focus uh, focuses on heritage tourism, machine learning, and archaeology in Peru. She received her master's in arts, uh, Master of Arts in Archaeology from Durham University in 2012 and has previously served on the Antiquities Coalition's hashtag Culture Under Attack under Threat Task Force and as the former Assistant Director of Saving Antiquities for Everyone, or SAFE. Today, she will be presenting collaborative digital scholarship she and her colleagues recently published in the Tourism Management Journal titled, uh, the article is titled, Learning Patterns of Tourist Movement and Photography from Geotagged Photos at Archaeological Heritage Sites in Cusco, Peru. Using machine learning approaches on social media photographs, Paintar detects tourist movement across, across heritage landscapes and compares how modern tourists perpetuate the visual perspectives of 19th and 20th century explorers in Peru through scene and object-based feature extraction. Without further ado, I present uh, Nicole Pintar. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, thank you to Albert and Alyssa and Lila Spenson and the UT Libraries um, for inviting me to participate in the Day of Digital Humanities and the Digital Scholarship and the Americas Speaker Series. Uh, my research intersects the fields of anthropology, computer science, and digital humanities, and is largely focused on machine learning applications for archaeology and cultural heritage in Peru, as Albert uh, previously said. Um, so today I will be presenting the results of a collaborative project between myself and my colleagues in the Department of Computer Science and Anthropology here at UT Austin. Um, which was recently published in Tourism Management. However, before moving into this case study, I wanted to take a few minutes by um, discussing some general social media statistics, as well as the significance of social media and internet photo collections as a potential source of data for humanities researchers. So in 2019, roughly 3.5 billion social media users were reported which amounts to nearly half the world's population. Social media has undoubtedly changed the way people live, connect, and experience the world. These platforms not only provide a space for users to interact beyond local and social boundaries, but they also offer unlimited opportunities to share user-generated content. The scale and potential of this data is unprecedented. Over 1.8 billion photos are uploaded per day, and when paired with machine learning algorithms, ordinary images posted on social media can provide humanities researchers with a deeper source of scientific inquiry through the quantification of visual culture. Our research utilizes publicly available images from Flickr, which is an image and video hosting platform and internet community. Established in 2004, Flickr now houses over 6 billion images and 87 million unique users. In terms of heritage management and sustainable tourism initiatives, publicly available geotagged images snapped by tourists and curated on social media provide significant ground level observations, including pop destination popularity, movement patterns, and cultural preferences. These metrics cannot be captured by traditional analyses of ticket sales or ethnography alone. Instead, AI generated 
image data allows researchers to analyze how individuals experience a destination and how humans shape the aesthetic legacies of the places they visit. Broadly speaking, aesthetic and cultural preferences are valuable for understanding the ways that people engage with and perceive place. While experiences can be relayed orally or through text, photographs do not require langu language translations and allow researchers to reveal how people see or are influenced to see places, whether through social media posts, destination marketing organizations, or news media. Machine learning applications also hold broad research applications for museum and archival professionals as visitors photograph objects and move through curated spaces, as well as for stylistic and typological analyses of artifacts. As I will discuss, machine learning allows researchers to analyze hundreds of thousands, and in some cases, millions of open source photos in a consistent objective way and at a relatively low cost. The near global availability of social media imagery provides humanities researchers with an emerging and exponentially expanding data source that is applicable across various contexts and spaces. Using Cusco Peru as a case study, the goals of this project were twofold. Our first goal was to understand how the intensification of tourism intersects with heritage regulations and social media aiding in tourist travel patterns. Our second goal was to assess how aesthetic preferences and visual experience become entangled with the evolving expectations of tourists whose travel narratives are curated on social media and grounded in historic site representations. Located in the Southwestern Andes Mountains of Peru, Cusco is the former capital of the Inca Empire and one of the world's best known tourist regions. Tourism contributes 7.6 billion annually to the Peruvian economy and provides 3.9% of Peru's GDP. Much of Peru's modern tourist economy centers on the idea of Andean timelessness, which links the Inca past to the present. This perception of timelessness is depicted in Cusco's imagery and aids in the creation of heritage hierarchies aestheticizes places and assigns economic and cultural value to heritage landscapes by selecting what is meant to be seen and preserved. In particular, imagery produced by 19th and 20th century explorers helped to popularize Cusco as a tourist destination and critically influenced how archeological sites were curated for mass consumption. It should be noted here that many foreign explorers like Adolf Bandelier, Ephraim George Squire and Clements Markham as well as domestic anthropologists and historians like Louis Valcarcel, Jose Maria Arguedas, and later Martin Chambi, among others, have influenced Cusco's heritage landscape. However, for our research purposes, we specifically focus on Hiram Bingham and the Yale Peruvian expedition. Bingham's sensationalized quote unquote discovery of Machu Picchu in 1911 brought global attention to Peru. Through his relationship with National Geographic magazine, Bingham shared his early encounters with Machu Picchu, but his expedition also helped to crystallize the modern touristic route in Cusco by illustrating and describing key sites, including Sacsayhuaman, Tambo Machai, Puka Pucara, Alante Tambo, Pisac Tapon, and Piquiacta. The vivid imagery of Bingham's publications encouraged growing numbers of foreigners to visit the Cusco region as tourists, with guidebooks appearing by the early 1920s. Over the next decade, government officials recognized the economic potential of tourism and began to fund reconstruction projects at tourist sites, including Sacsayhuaman, Tambo Machai, Peak Yacta, and Pisac. By the mid-1970s, tourist visits to the Cusco region topped 100,000, and local archaeologists and officials sought to develop broader itineraries that would encourage tourists to spend more time and money in the Inca heartland. Established in 1978, Cusco's original Boleto Turistico, or what will be referred to here as the BTC, allowed 10-day visitor access to the region's top archaeological attractions. 
Tourist initiatives in the 1970s also included the promotion of the Inca Trail, a heritage route to Machu Picchu, which along with the monumental center of Cusco became the first Peruvian properties to be added to UNESCO's World Heritage List in 1983. In 2008, the BTC circuit was expanded to include a one-day pass to Sacsayhuaman, Kenko, Temple Machai, and Puka Pucara, a two-day pass to Cusco's six museums and the archaeological sites of Tipon and Tiquiafta, and a two-day pass to Pisac, Olante, Tambo, Chinchero, and Morai. The addition of the one- and two-day passes has contributed to an uptick in visits to Cusco's more remote sites and has also affected movement patterns between BTC sites. For a case study, the 10 archeological sites included on the BTC, as well as Cusco's two UNESCO World Heritage Sites are the foundation for our research and quantitative image analysis. In order to elicit a quantitative story for this heritage circuit and to connect the last 15 years of tourism to visuality established by early explorers, we collected publicly available photos from Flickr taken at the 12 archeological sites in our study. Following the creation of our Flickr dataset, a Markov chain and convolutional neural network were implemented. We collected photos taken at all 12 archeological sites by querying with the site's GPS coordinates and taking the top 4,000 retrieved images from each site. We then expanded this collection to form an album for each user by querying with all unique user IDs specified to retrieve photos within the time the user visited the sites. Each photo collected included metadata like the image URL, the owner's ID, geotag, and timestamp. In total, 57,804 images were collected from 2,261 users. These metrics were later used to infer site popularity rankings within our data set. To detect patterns of tourist movement and analyze their change over time, we modeled tourist transition sequences using a Markov chain. A Markov chain is a stochastic model for a sequence of events that assumes that the probability of each event depends only on the state attained in the previous event. In our study, an event is a site visit, and a sequence is the order of sites a tourist travel to. This allows us to discover popular transitions between sites, how transitions are affected by policies regulating heritage landscapes, like the release of the BTC ticket package, and how transitions change over time. To identify scenes and objects photographed by users at each site and detect patterns of iconicity, a convolutional neural network is used to extract semantic features from images. Neural networks are a series of algorithms that work to recognize underlying relationships in a set of data, mimicking human intelligence. In computer vision, features extracted from deep CNNs or convolutional neural networks are widely used to capture objects and scenes in an image. We adopted a ResNet 50 architecture, um, which is pre-trained on ImageNet, a database with more than 10 million images and 1K common object categories. By utilizing a CNN pre-trained on ImageNet for a clustering analysis, we are able to identify multiple real world objects simultaneously without deploying different algorithms for each object without the added cost of manual labor, for which the task would be impossible. Our goal was to find common themes of canonical views taken at each archeological site. Additionally, we will also explore the, the statistics of which types of scenes are observed across photos at each site. To accomplish this, we again utilize a ResNet 50 CNN architecture, but we pre-train on the MIT Places dataset which houses over 2.5 million images and 400 unique scene categories. Because ImageNet is an object-centric database, it is not possible to extract scene labels, making it necessary to also train on MIT places for this specific task. Clustering algorithms were then used to discover common image themes at each site, such as mountains, stonework, alpaca, terracing, among others. 
Our analysis included tourist statistics at each site, whether tourist transition patterns may be attributable to available BTC tickets and the discovered canonical view themes. While our best efforts were made to avoid sampling bias and statistical oversight, not all tourists traveling to BTC and UNESCO sites take the same amount of photos, geotag photos, or even upload photos to internet photo collections. Despite these factors, our quantitative analysis is valuable for addressing tourist practices at a key moment of economic, social, and technological change in the Cusco region. Site popularity was determined by comparing the total number of images gathered per site versus the total number of unique visitors per site. Machu Picchu was unsurprisingly the most popular site with 1,498 visitors and over 31,000 photos taken, followed by Cusco with over 1,200 visitors and, 11, 000, and over 11,000 photos taken. The former is one of the most iconic heritage sites globally, and the latter is the major point of entry to the region. Of the sites visited, Peak Yacta and Tapon were the least popular, likely due to their remote location to the southeast of Cusco. Popularity rankings were generally consistent between visitor count and photo frequency, with slight differences between Chincharo and Morai. A density map was generated using ArcGIS software from the total number of photos taken by users at all 12 sites to visualize landscape hotspots. The number of unique visitors and average time spent at each site are also shown here. Tourists spent the longest time at Cusco, which serves as the region's only transportation hub and is where most hotel and guest houses are located. Tourists were found to spend upwards of 10 hours at Machu Picchu. Travel to Machu Picchu is often packaged as a day trip or overnight stay um, via rail, allowing for more time to be spent at the site. Tourists may also choose to trek the Inca Trail, which involves a multi-day excursion through the Andes Mountains to reach Machu Picchu. By contrast, tourists spent less than an hour at Tambo Machai, Pisac, Chinchero, and Puka Pucara. Tour groups with limited time schedules may account for the amount of time spent at Pisac and Chinchero, whereas Tambo Machai and Puka Pucara are small and can be covered quickly before moving to more popular sites like Saxe Limon and Kinko. Significantly, these statistics offer a window into the cultural heritage circuit over the last 15 years in ways that are not possible with traditional methods. For example, ticket purchase rates or manual surveys do not capture duration of visits or photographic preferences, but the tourist photos do. Additionally, transition probabilities were computed for the entire 2004 to 2019 time range. The top six transitions between sites are plotted as arrows here. The most frequent tourist transition was from Tambo Machai to Puku Bukhara, as they're within a three minute walk from each other. The other most frequent transitions moved toward Machu Picchu. In most cases, visitors travel to one of four sites prior to departing from Machu Picchu, including Alante Tambo, Marai, Pisac, and Chinchero. All four sites are in close proximity to Machu Picchu and may account for this pattern. Next, we compute a separate transition matrix for travels made before and after 2008, which marks the introduction of additional BTC one, two, and three tourist tickets. The results are depicted here as a heat map. Phase A displays higher site-specific transi transition sequences like Peak Yacta to Machu Picchu and Puka Pucara to Kenko, and low regional diversity of movement between sites. The site-specific transitions in phase A decrease in phase B as regional transition probabilities increase across the matrix. This suggests that there is a greater range in dispersal of site transitions in phase B, weakening the stronger site-to-site -site sequences that previously existed. The three outline boxes represent BTC1, 2, and 3 groupings. For the BTC1 grouping, phase A transitions are concentrated around nearby sites, namely Tambo Machai to Kukukara or Kenko to Saxe Laman. During phase B, transition patterns become more symmetric and diffused among all four sites. 
This is true for transitions in BTC2 and 3 as well, though slightly less obvious. The change in BTC transition patterns may indicate how the ticket packages encourage tourists to explore more sites through condensed day trip itineraries. In phase B, travel patterns shift away from BTC1 sites and toward BTC3 sites, in part due to increased hotel construction in the Sacred Valley, which has intensified the use of Olante Tambo as the point of departure to Machu Picchu, as well as access to Chinchero, Pisac, and Morai. Movement between sites on the BTC3 ticket were most complex across phase A. Or, yes, sorry, were most uh, complex across phase A. Um, popular circuits between BTC3 sites were discernible during phase A and appear to be the antecedent for the BTC3 pass. Following the addition of the BTC3 pass, visits to BTC3 sites and transition patterns shift significantly. The most significant of these impacts affected travel to PSAC. During phase A, visitors to PSAC access the site from two main points, Chinchero or Saxewa Mountain. Phase B saw the disappearance of these two transition points to PSAC, with all sites similarly likely to access it. While the main transit out from PSAC or heading towards Olante Tambo remained the same in both phases. Overall, the transition matrix indicates that changes to the BTC reflect existing touristic access practices, as well as the altered ways that tourists might move among the sites on a given ticket and how they might transition between those tickets and other heritage sites. To determine canonical V themes, we explore the following questions. What do tourists notice at sites and consider photo worthy? Do tourist images converge around a set of views? And how do these patterns interact with heritage-based regulations? We first detect the scene types present in each photo to obtain the distribution of captured scenes across all sites. We then break this distribution down to first visualize which scenes dominate a specific site and then determine what the scenes look like at each site. To begin answering these questions, we quantify the contents of discovered canonical views per site. We use a ResNet 50 CNN architecture, pre-trained on scene categories in the MIT Places dataset to predict scene labels in our data. Predicted scenes were aggreg aggregated on photos in each site to retrieve the most frequent scene labels. We take the most frequent 10% of scenes from each site as a representative scene category and plot the scene site occurrence matrix. The scenes are sorted from most natural to most artificial. Common scenes occurring across all BTC and UNESCO sites were mountain path and valley, archeological excavation and ruins, and amphitheater. Labels such as Medina, Casbah, and Bazaar also correspond well to market scenes captured in Cusco, Pisac, and Chinchero. Roadside markets are the at the entrance of archaeological sites are common in the Cusco region and account for similar labels associated with Piquiacta and Tapone. Our detected scene label show a strong correlation to the major scene themes identified within our cluster results in the following slides. Visualization of shared themes or the predicted scenes across all sites include mountain landscapes, alpaca, and stone architecture which are similar to our common scene labels. Photos of Peruvian peoples wearing traditional dress are mostly found in Cusco, Chinchero, and Pisac. At these locations, large open air markets attract tourists wishing to purchase Peruvian textiles, pottery, and souvenirs. Cusco also hosts many festivals and parades to which traditional dance groups from across the country are invited. A high percentage of images also correspond to colonial architecture particularly in Cusco and Chinchero, where colonial churches are a major attraction. To visualize representative, representative photos at each site, we ran an infinity propagation clustering algorithm for each site to discover clusters and take the center image from the largest cluster as a representative image. Not only do these popular themes, such as stone architecture, mountains, and agricultural terracing, co 
correspond to our distribution of detected scenes in the previous TSNI visualization, but also images of site-specific scenes, such as colonial architecture, indigenous peoples, and markets, which were depicted for the sites of Cusco and Chinchero. To quantitatively understand the clusters discovered at each site, we look at three measurements, the number of clusters discovered, the separation score between clusters, and the compactness score within a cluster. The first two measure the diversity of clusters, as the more clusters discovered, the more separated clusters are, and the more different clusters are from each other. This indicates greater variety in how tourists photograph a site. The compactness score measures the homogeneity of clusters as the tighter or denser a cluster is, the more similar data points are to each other within that cluster. And hence, there is less variation in tourist photos of a particular landmark. UNESCO sites were found to have the greatest amount of clusters, meaning more varied photos taken, and reflect how tourists spent longer periods of time at these sites. Large sites are seen to have the highest compactness scores revealing the reproduction of popular photo themes, whereas smaller sites have lower compactness scores, likely due to the unrestricted tourist movement at these sites. These patterns shed light on the impact of cultural heritage management decisions in recent years. Due to the growth of mass tourism, several of Cusco's most popular archeological sites are no longer free range. Instead, movement within these sites are restricted to predefined paths. For example, at Machu Picchu, visitors must purchase their site permits months in advance to guarantee entry before they travel. Upon arrival to the site, tourists are guided through a set route to avoid damage to sensitive areas. In 2019, new regulations were adopted, limiting tourists to a maximum of four hours at the site, with three daily entry shifts scheduled between 6 a.m. and 3 p.m. Efforts to prevent the deterioration of heritage spaces and restrict movements have also been initiated at Olante Tambo, where tourists are directed up the terraces of Pumatayas towards the Sun Temple and the Wall of Six Monoliths before moving towards the site's funerary complexes. Her results suggest that the conservation initiatives and entry regulations that have been enacted have increased photo homogeneity at larger sites as tourists are made to follow predefined routes through heritage, attra heritage attractions, allowing for the reproduction of objects and scenes. At smaller sites like Chinchero, Pukapukara, and Kenko, photo homogeneity remains lower as tourist movement is unrestricted, allowing a wider variety of images. Finally, our results hint at the influence of historical images in guiding how current tourists experience a heritage site. Notably, many of the representative images identified in the top 10% of clusters share aesthetic qualities with historic photographs published by Hiram Bingham in the early 20th century. The continued reproduction and distribution of these scenes on social media platforms creates a visual heritage narrative that influences the expectations of future travelers on the landscape. When a particular image or scene achieves dominance, alternative ways of experiencing landscapes are inevitably obscured. Therefore, heritage discourses like that generated by early explorers and perpetuated by Cusco's modern tourism industry generate aesthetic legacies over time by reproducing that which is meant to be seen based on perceived experiences and values extracted from audience consumption. Overall, our study provides an innovative and first of its kind application of computer vision and machine learning algorithms to quantify the visuality of heritage landscapes and analyze the influence of heritage regulations on tourist circuits in the Cusco region. By utilizing publicly available geotech source data from internet photos, we are able to analyze tourist movement amongst BTC and UNESCO sites. Knowledge of travel patterns across heritage landscapes provides vital information not only for heritage conservation and the management of archeological sites, but also for assessing the economic impacts that new regulations may have on local communities who depend on the recurrent influx of visitors. 
through pattern recognition tools like feature extract extraction, image recognition, and clustering, we are able to show a broad overview of the diversity and hom homogeneity of tourist-generated images and identify how travelers are visually experiencing Cusco's heritage landscape. These techniques also provide opportunities for qualitative and quantitative comparisons with historic imagery to address the reproduction of aesthetic legacies. The power of convolutional neural networks to extract image features and compare tens of thousands of photos within a short period, as well as the ability of clustering algorithms to automatically cluster site images based on their visual characteristics, discovers trends at a scale that would be extremely difficult and time consuming, if not impossible through human labor alone. For those who may be interested in uh, reading more in depth about our methodology or additional analyses and results, um, our paper can be found uh, through tourism management. And finally, um, I would like to thank my co-authors, Waylon Chow, Dr. Alan Covey, and Dr. Kristen Grauman, as well as Albert Palacios, Alyssa Guzman, and of course, Lila Spenson and the UT Libraries for hosting this event and inviting me to speak. Um, as part of this uh, day of digital humanities. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. So at this point, we have roughly 15 minutes or so for uh, questions from our audience. Um, if you have questions, you can either raise up your hand and then uh, we'll call you and you can unmute yourself. Or uh, we can, you can also type your question on the chat and we can um, ask our speaker that question verbally. So at this point, I invite you all to uh, pose your questions. Should I stop screen sharing or should I keep this? Uh, just keep it for a little bit so that uh, everybody can see the, the instructions there. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from Nell Yang. Uh, you can go ahead. Thank you. Um, thank you, Nikki, that was fantastic. Uh, very excited to um, have more conversation with you, but I guess just as, as a way to get the conversation started. Um, you um, engage really interestingly with sort of like the methods being used. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of directions here and I think mostly I was just curious as to, um, especially because this wasn't the, the focus of the paper, I was wondering what conclusions you kind of came to as an anthropologist about why um, tourists took photos and what sort of like personal analysis you have or personal read you had on that sort of compulsion that tourists have to take photos that are very sort of um, sort of compliant with this aesthetic legacy that you're talking about, right? Like what did they get out of it? Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. Um, and especially now in this digital age, there's kind of that see and be seen mentality um, that tourists seem to have in terms of, you know, picture it didn't happen, right? Um, as they would say. Um, but in terms of what's kind of driving the photo homogeneity or tourist experiences, um, I think it's a combination of things. I think there is this really sensational moment um, that happened through news media coverage of different explorations and expeditions happening in the late 19th and 20th centuries that kind of fueled this drive towards opening Peru and Cusco particularly as a tourist destination. Um, and I really see that kind of continuing through those images that are iconic that are being reproduced by tourists today um, definitely have a legacy um, aesthetically. And that's something um, I'm working on more in terms of quantifying where those images were actually taken with insights themselves versus where um, uh, explorers like Bingham or Markham or Chambi uh, um, were taking those photos to see how people are kind of moving through sites and how they're actually reproducing that. Um, I think part of it too is that those regulations kind of funnel through uh, tourists through sites in very specific ways 
And because you already have these kind of popular vantage points um, from the historic perspective, um, I think that definitely kind of helps generate more of the same in some ways at these more popular sites. Yeah, because it strikes me as almost somewhat paradoxical that like the work of the tourists actually reinforces the touristic infrastructure. And what seems to me that the tourists sort of ultimately is deprived of is that sort of like sensation or experience of exploration that they were sort of after to begin with, right? And this is, I think, just me sort of thinking about my own tourist photos and seeing that they're sort of like, they're kind of dead to me in some sense, right? Because they sort of just are so compliant, right? Relative to sort of the, maybe the more sort of improvised or, or, or less conventionalized kind of photography that I happen to make. But thank you, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Um, next is Barbara Miller. Forgot to unmute myself. Um, I'm Barbara Miller from Cal State Fullerton. Nicole, it's nice to meet you and hear about this. Did you find any exceptions to these? I mean, I, I know you talked about some separation, um, but uh, you didn't really show us any examples of, of, of uh, tourist photos that actually broke. I mean, there actually there was one of yours that you took that was not within the. <laughs> but did you take any? Uh, did I look at the ones that didn't conform to uh, conventional um, aesthetics? Um, that's a great question, and it's really nice to meet you as well. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, we did. We. That wasn't the focus, but there was definitely tourist photos at smaller sites um, like Puka Pakara, Tambo Machai, um, where you can kind of roam over the sites themselves um, and collect photos that aren't um, part of that historic narrative or what we're seeing kind of reproduced at the larger sites. Um, so I would definitely say yes. Uh, that we did see kind of different images being produced, a lot of selfies. Um, that was a big one where, you know, the type of equipment that was being used by historic expeditions, you wouldn't really necessarily see that. Um, <laughs> not very practical. Um, but for the smaller sites, yes, there's definitely things that break the mold. And I think that would be really interesting to kind of explore more and see if there's new kind of trends developing in terms of iconicity um, at these smaller sites that may kind of produce a counter narrative to that aesthetic legacy. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Um, actually, along that vein, I'm going to go ahead and, and ask my question. Um, as you were looking at this corpus, uh, did any potential privacy issues emerge uh, or concerns, right, in terms of what was being depicted, particularly the selfies, right, that's what I'm thinking about? Um, and if so, how did your team address them or navigate through those issues? Did you exclude them? Was there an asterisk placed on them, et cetera? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so when we're actually, we were using the Flickr API to create our data set, um, we're actually able to search for those that are publicly available um, in terms of privacy that they've already been released. Um, there's also Creative Commons licensing um, for a lot of the photos as well in terms of what people deem as shareable um, and what can be reproduced. Um, so those were things we did kind of account for in the general search um, when we were um, acquiring imagery. Um, and then we were also very kind of mindful to blur faces and kind of add these other precautions for any images that we were including within our uh, publication. Um, just trying to think about privacy and um, not, not using um, selfies. Um, and other images that were very kind of close up um, of people without permission. Thank you, Nicole. Any other questions from the audience? 
I have another one lined up, but I don't want to usurp the, the whole question and answer. Sorry, please make it. All right, I'll do a follow up then. Um, and it's it's actually tying back to uh, a little bit on um, Mel Yang's question related to um, the positioning of the tourists right within this landscape. Mm -hmm. Did you all see any patterns or, um, yeah, I guess any patterns in terms of having a pristine or just a photograph of the landscape and uh, tourists position themselves within that landscape? Was there any correlations or patterns that you noticed off of that that might go back towards identity and identity creation within cultural heritage sites? Sorry, what was the last part of the question? I, I got cut yeah. off. Yeah, in terms of, did you all see any patterns in terms of how people position themselves within the, the, the scene, right? Within uh, what was being depicted in the background? Um, was there more of those, less so, et cetera? Um, oh, that's, that's something we, we didn't quite account for. Um, in terms of off the top of my head, in terms of uh, what I had seen, just kind of sorting through the photos myself um, to make sure that the accuracy of what was um, being labeled as uh, landscapes or uh, markets or things. Um, there definitely was at Machu Picchu. Um, there's one particular um, image that kind of kept cropping up again and again. And I don't know if I can go back. Um, I'm still screen sharing, yes. Um, but these here, um, where you can kind of see the tourists, this was a very common pose. Um, There's a lot of yoga posing. There was a lot of um, this kind of back towards the camera and more just general selfies taken at this location. Um, and oddly, I've never been to Machu Picchu myself. I've been to all the other sites that I've studied, um, but uh, I, I believe that this is one of the first kind of vantage points when you're approaching the site um, from the Inca Trail. Uh, so it's a very common one. And uh, off the top of my head, that's, that's the one that I can think of the most frequently. And that's something I'm definitely interested in exploring more in terms of, you know, this historic kind of representation and its um, replication over time to see, recalculate kind of where these images were taken with insights and then looking at where tourists are kind of reproducing the same photos or if there's new clusters, um, which Barbara brought up. Um, that might be determining new iconicity. Thank you, Nicole. Any other questions from the audience? Yes, Barbara. Having been to Machu Picchu many times, that is actually, if you are entering from the top, some of those photos are from way up above if, if you came on the Inca Trail. Mm -hmm. And some of them, even though they look similar, some of them are from the entrance uh, from down, that you come up from down below and are uh, by the uh, um, uh, tourist bus and then are mm -hmm. discharged and you walk in. Um, I'm just, just to put a bee in your bonnet, it would be interesting if you could manage to get together a collection of pre-social media pictures in this area. Um, I, I was able to visit the site before the tourist <laughs> um, <laughs> board of Cusco got a hold of uh, all that stuff. And because I was with locals, I was often able to uh, wander around where other people weren't allowed. Um, and so uh, even though I took a lot of those typical pictures, I also was able to get um, other kinds of pictures that people don't have. Um, yeah, yeah I, that was in, in, at several different sites, including in Cusco itself, like pictures from the uh, top of the cathedral and things like that where no one was allowed. But anyway, the point is, um, I'm, I guess I, w I can't call myself a typical tourist in Peru because I actually lived there for a while. So, uh, but, um, but finding out um, how this evolved, the, the, did the people who were tourists prior to the age of social media 
also duplicate this or were they more original in their photo taking? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's a great point. And that's something I would love to explore more, um, trying to kind of curate those images in that time gap between, you know, the 1920s and maybe 2004. The rest yeah, it would, and, and it would be hard collecting them, but it, <laughs> Um, anyway, thank you. you. Like to donate, please feel free. <laughs> thank you, Barbara. And we have one question from Nell. Um, just to, add, I guess, to add the post to Barbara's pre, right? Um, and this question of vantage point. Did you have to account, out of curiosity, for any like drone photography? That like, is that something that's happening? that people are sort of like flying their drones into the air to take photos from different vantage points, which in some sense are like, the, is like the only possible way when it comes to height, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's, that's not something I'm totally sure of. I know you can at some sites. I don't know if at sites like Machu Picchu, there may be restrictions in terms of drone use. Um, and I mean, in terms of looking at the scenes themselves, I think they would still be categorized similarly in terms of whether it's a mountain landscape or archaeological or market or something um, of that nature. Any other questions? Actually, uh, AJ, uh, Adrian Johnson from the Benson, he pointed out there are archives at the Benson you can check out. So plug in for the Benson Lambergan collection. Um, and actually, uh, I had the pleasure of working with Nicole uh, this past uh, spring, it's, it seems a, a long time ago now, um, where we were actually working with a collection of postcards from the 1920s uh, for um, a class with Dr. Astrid Randall Beer on uh, archeology span and uh, ancient, ancient art and archeology span of Peru. Um, and I'll go ahead, I'm going to go ahead and share that collection for you all if you're interested. I'm also going to do a plug-in for the uh, exhibition that was created uh, using the Art and Art Histories collection on the Peruvian um, pottery that they have, the Andean pottery that they have uh, in, in their collection. I'll plug it in a little bit in the uh, chat box. But uh, for now, are there any other questions for Nicole? And actually, uh, Astrid, if you can hear me, if you have the, the link right off the top there <laughs> in your browser, if you can share it in the chat. I really appreciate it. I can't seem to pull it up quickly on my, on my screen here. Well, I want to again thank you, uh, thank Nicole Pintor for sharing her research, her and her colleagues' research with us today. Um, really appreciate it. And also the conversation that was prompted through it. Uh, thank you all for contributing that. Um, at this point, I'll go ahead and uh, give the word to my colleague, Alyssa Guzman, who's going to be talking about the remaining part of the day of DH event. Great. Thank you, Albert. And thank you, Nicole, for such a fascinating and fantastic talk. Um, Nicole, if you wouldn't mind um, ending your screen share, I'm going to go ahead and put the schedule for the rest of the day up. Um, Right, so oops. we are now at a break um, and I'm going to leave the Zoom meeting open. We're in the same meeting all afternoon, um, but please come back shortly before two o'clock when we will start the humanities data panel. Thanks again for joining us for Day of Digital Humanities.